Good morning, everybody. I, uh, I am super grateful that you're here this morning. Sunday, uh, you know, I bet you're up partying your asses off last night or having a good time. Uh, so I'm really glad you're here this morning. Uh, my name is Trevor Warren. And uh, the talk I'm going to give today is something that I feel uh, ridiculously passionate about. And, um, and it's funny, I had a, an experience uh, about four days ago after I, I had given this talk a few months back to a group of counselors. And um, when I wanted to do the talk for this group, I realized, well, it's a different crowd. You know, these people are not, there's going to be some healers and therapists in the crowd, but uh, probably a lot more sexually liberated and different things like that. So uh, I rewrote the talk and I presented it in front of my, my men's group and my partner about three days ago, and they, they took it like this, and they went <laughs> And they said, they said uh, there wasn't enough, uh, enough personal in it about my particular journey and, and what I've been on. So I've spent the last three days uh, rewriting uh, this, this talk, and, uh, and I feel pretty good about it. So I'm excited to, and, I, and the other thing is I had to cut out a ton of information. Like, I'm a research geek. I like facts and shit like that. So I'm like, chop, 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 chop. So anyways, so um, I've been a counselor for almost a quarter century now. And the last 20, I've been working with couples specifically. And uh, that's been a beautiful opportunity to be let into. I've worked, I think, with over a 1,000 couples at this point. And so I've been let into a lot of people's lives. And so that's the context that I come from on this topic or the launch of that topic. And uh, I'm also what, what I consider to be a, a budding sex actualist, a se sex activist, because um, I'm really I'm excited about sex, <laughs> and I'm really worried about it at the same time in terms of what's happening in our culture. Um, I also. Uh, I'm also a Gemini, which makes me really curious, and, and I, I can, I'm a real thinker and analyzer and things like that. So all of those things kind of go into uh, my passion for this topic this morning. So I'm going to take you on a journey in hopes of inspiring you to become more of what I call sexually integrated. Uh, this is a term I got from, uh, does anybody know Women's Anatomy of Sexual Arousal, Sherry Winston? Oh, it's an incredible, incredible book. And she talks about sexual integration. I was like, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. But there wasn't a really clear definition of it, so I've been kind of mulling it. And so this is what I've come up with, that sexually integrated is where sex is integrated into our culture in a way that is normalized, that sex is not a thing. It's not shameful. It's not weird. It's not something we're not talking about. It makes room, our culture makes room for it to be expressed fully in healthy ways. It's congruent with the nature and the diversity of who we truly are as sexual beings. It's inclusive. It's recognized as an essential element of our personal power, our source of vitality. And it's not marginalized, it's celebrated. It's just the same thing as we talk about emotions or weather or anything like that. It's just part of who we are and recognized for the value that it is. Currently, our relationship with sexuality and our cultural culture is, is uh, I find, quite paradoxical and unnerving at the same time. On the one hand, we have, we have sexual imagery everywhere on billboards and movies and websites and things like that. And there's so much provocative, erotic imagery. And yet, in spite of all of that abundance, um, the imagery to me doesn't feel very real or embodied at all. I think we're more confused about sexuality. Uh, and I think we're a lot more repressed than, than we might think. We've been taught how to be sexy, but we haven't, uh, we haven't been taught how to be sexual. It's confusion around that. And I believe that this is a reflection of like thousands of years of what I would call sexual disintegration. We have a very long history, and I'm going to go into that in a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you a story about my own. This is a story about my own personal journey around sexual liberation and some of the many shocking and disheartening truths that I've learned along the way that are barriers 
uh, to becoming that, both individually and as a society. And that story begins with shame. Shame's a, a hot topic, I've noticed this year. I think I, I, think I read shame in f at least f maybe three or four of the titles this year. So, so when, I was, uh, when I was 12 years old, I think I was 11 or 12, uh, I lived in Pickering, Ontario in a really big, beautiful house with my family. It was kind of like the Brady Bunch. It was uh, a mixed family. And uh, I was downstairs in the, in the hallway, or it's like in the, in just inside where I come into the, to the house, and there's a bookshelf there. And on the bookshelf was a book called The Joy of Sex. Does anybody know that book? Just, yeah. So I'm like curious and, you know, um, and I... I, I see it on the shelf and I'm like, I probably saw it a few different times before I got up enough courage to even pull it off the shelf. And so I remember one day I'm like, standing there, I'm pr pretty sure no one was there, and I'm like, I sneak it off the shelf and I stick it up under here and I zip on upstairs, uh, you know, for some good nighttime reading. What an amazing book. There was these pencil sketches of all these people having sex, and it was just, it was so lovely. And so uh, it was kind of like my first kind of visual into, you know, what is sex? And, uh, and then a few weeks later, I remember walking down the steps from my bedroom. I remember it so clearly that I remember we had these blue, royal blue carpets. And, and I remember I was about the third or fourth step down and down around through there is the kitchen. And I heard my dad say, uh, Trevor has the Joy of Sex book under his bed. Uh -huh. And I, my whole being just went, <laughs> I felt everything just crushed down. I was in a panic. And I stopped and I turned around. I went back in my room, shut my door, and I was like, what am I going to do? I'm caught. I'm fucking caught. And uh, I felt so much shame there. And I was like, huh. And then, and then when I thought about that story some more, I, 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 I thought to myself, why was it so difficult for me to pull this book off the shelf? And then I realized as I recalled the story that my dad didn't say, oh my gosh, Trevor has the joy of sex book under his bed. Can you believe it? He didn't say that. He said, Trevor has the joy of sex book under his bed. It was factual. But I took so much shame on that. I was like, oh my God. So I was like, that really started to get me curious. And I figured that a lot of us have some kind of story like that uh, around, you know, shame. And of course, it's a big topic this, this year. So, yeah, sex is one of the most hardest topics for us to talk about openly. By show of hands, how many of you would say you keep hidden some aspect of your sexuality, be it your swinger, you're gay, or you like to be choked when you have sex, or whatever it is, for fear of consequence from friends, family, or like colleagues. Does anybody hold back on that? Yeah. It's pretty, we, we have to hide a lot of this stuff. So I got really curious. I thought, like, well, how the hell did we get here? Like, what, what, how did we get here? So I figured there's three major reasons why it's hard to talk about and express ourselves sexually. The first one has to do with our own pain and sexual trauma around sex. The second thing is sexual ignorance or just lack of information uh, about what sex is. And the third thing is uh, that we have a very long and powerful history of shame surrounding sex. So I'm going to start with shame and a long history of it because I believe that that's at root of the other, of the other two. Uh, all three of the major religions have some messages about sexual shame, but for right now, I'm just going to focus on Christianity just for a minute. And I want to say again how much of my talk, I, I'm, I'm grieving how much of my talk I had to cut out uh, around this stuff. So I'm just giving you like the tip of the iceberg on this stuff. If you go right back to the beginning, to the story of Genesis, and you have a look at what's said there, it's very interesting. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and I and, and, quote, both were naked and were not ashamed. <clears throat> then they take a bite of the apple. Quote, the eyes of both were open and they knew they were naked. Now, does anybody know what happens right after that? 
What happens? Punishment. Uh, you're being told to body. Yes. And what what do they do about being naked? Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Go right over the what? Yes. Yeah, it's not the nose, it's not the toes, it's the genitals. I'm like, wow, that's an interesting message. Like, okay, so, and then shame just, just drops in. They're kicked out. Boom, you're bad. So that's a, that's a powerful story. And then what I realized, too, is that, that Christianity as a, as a religion is centered upon a figure whose holiness begins with having been conceived asexually, immaculate conception. So anyways, that's, those are just the beginning of a very long history around these religions that have said, this is bad. Historically, sex has been treated as an obstacle to holiness. It's, 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 a, it's a necessary evil in order to propagate the species. And this is very surprising to me because I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I've studied Tantra, and Tantra is actually of the belief that it is indeed the, the, some of the path to enlightenment. So that's religion. Now, religion, of course, informs culture. We've been in a long, very long puritanical hangover. Uh, most of us know that during the 1800s in the Victorian era that they had a very frigid relationship with sexuality. I'm going to give you a quote from the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal. This is in 1850, where they declared, quote, Masturbation is public enemy number one. <laughs> Neither plague, nor war, nor smallpox, nor a crowd of similar evils have resulted more disastrously for humanity than the habit of masturbation. It is the destroying element of civilized society. Can you say where that's from again? <laughs> New Orleans Medical, Medical and Surgical Journal. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, 1850. So that's a while back. I wanted to give you a sense of the history. I'm going to take talk, talk. I was going to say lots about what's happening now, but I had to cut all that out of my talk. Um, so this is just a bit, a bit of the history. The attempts to suppress sexuality uh, from public shaming to genital mutilation to witch hunts. Some of you know about Kellogg's cornflakes uh, and anti-masturbation belts. Uh, which were actually used in the States right up until the 1930s. And it wasn't until 1973 that homosexuality, or all evidence of it being a disorder, was removed from the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. Yeah, so uh, it, it's not, although we've had a long history of it, it's also, it's also happening now. And then there's our families. Um, now, there's a huge variability in terms of the messages that we receive from our family. Some of us grew up with parents who walked around naked and it was all cool. That's at one end of the continuum. And the other end of the continuum, uh, I was a, I, back in the day when I was a youth worker, I worked in a home and, and there, was a, there was a girl there, I think she was about 18, 17, 18, and she had narrowly escaped an honor killing from her father when she was discovered naked with a, with a boy. So... There's quite a bit of range in terms of the messages that we get from our families around, around sexuality. So these messages, you know, again, have been lo long-standing and powerful, and they inevitably inform the societal attitudes that we have about sexuality that are surrounding us today. So the second reason... It's difficult to talk and be expressed fully sexually is because, well, of course, shame translates into ignorance because how can we, how can we uh, get educated on something we can't talk about? It's hard. It's tricky. There is an entire planet of missing and inaccurate information about sex. Sex education for kids still is a very narrow scope. It's basically about STIs, contraception, ba basic anatomy. Like I don't know where they, where they learn about pleasure or or, or um, you know, uh, sexual, um, like how to become a kiss kissing aficionado and what pleasure really is and embodiment and all these types of things. It's very limited. The scope is tiny. Sex-positive studies are routinely discouraged and underfunded. 
Um, here's a quote from Reverend Peter Sprigg in the early 2000s. This person is the Director of Marriage and Family Studies uh, for the Family Research Council, which is a powerful conservative lobbying group in Washington. And this quote, We know the formula for sexual health, which is sex within a monogamous lifelong relationship. Studying permutations of it, we think, is an effort, like Kinsey's, to change the sexual mores of the society so that what most people consider deviant behaviors looks more normal. Power, these are, and these people are making changes, and I'm going to get to that a little later. These, these are powerful groups that are informing what's okay about sexuality. Does everybody know who Kinsey is? Anybody not know who Kinsey is? Kinsey, yeah, famous uh, psychologist, researcher, totally overturned so many of our ideas about what our true sexual behavior is. Yeah, so when we can't talk about sex, where do we turn to learn about pleasure and eroticism and explore our sexual identity and fantasy and how to become multi-orgasmic? There's so much good stuff that we can't talk about. And a lot of the times we end up turning to like porn and, and romance novels and stuff like that. And these are, for the most part, inaccurate and incomplete models for us to aspire to. Now, the third reason is our sexual trauma, the pain that surrounds sexuality for many of us. Here are just a few very sobering North American stats. One in four women will be sexually assaulted during their lifetime. One in 33 men will be sexually assaulted during their lifetime. 80% of sexual assailants are friends and families of the victim. And 17% of girls under 16 have experienced some form of incest. So you do the math, you know, even, even just in this room, some of us have been, have been traumatized by, se by sexual violence. It's a painful topic for us to talk about. So with all this shame and ignorance and trauma, it's no wonder it's hard to talk about and express ourselves sexually. Our sex drive, I believe, is super powerful, and I would say it's maybe only second to our survival instinct. It's super powerful. It has the potential to override some of our most powerful sensibilities. Um, and, and trying to suppress sex is like, kind of like, I heard this a couple months ago, it's like trying to play whack-a-mole. Does everybody know the whack-a-mole game? <laughs> Pops up somewhere else. It's a, it's a super powerful drive. And, and when, when you have a really powerful drive like that that gets thwarted, it, 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 uh, its tendency is to do two things. One, it gets stronger, and two, it's expressed in perverted ways, unhealthy ways. Now, some of you might say, although maybe you wouldn't, because again, we're here kind of more sexually liberated or more co uh, we're conscious, more, more aware around sexuality. You might say that we are sexually liberated, or we get, you know, we're getting there. After all, we've had the 60s, the sexual revolution, now we've got gay, the gay marriages are legalized, you know, it's legal to uh, go topless in, in BC, at least ostensibly, you know, it's like, you can still get in a lot of trouble for doing it. And, uh, and there's conferences just like this one, Con, which I just want to put, a, put out some kudos to, to Wendy and uh, Diane and Kale just for creating this. It's like, oh my god, we need more of this stuff. So, so you might say that we've you know, come some way towards sexual liberation, but I get you to look again, because if we've taken a couple steps forward, I, I actually think we're actually taking one step back right now. And I might seem a bit alarmist here, but I'm not convinced we're moving towards what I call sexual integration right now. There are some, like I said, some very powerful right-wing conservative lobbying groups. There's government policies, there's censorship initiatives, and they're all putting the squeeze on sexuality, especially on uh, sexual, sexually related websites. Kai actually referred to this in his talk the other day. The US Congress just passed FOSTA, which is uh, the fight online sex trafficking. And it subjects these websites to criminal and civil liability for when the users misuse online personals unlawfully. So this has had a cascading effect across FetLife. Uh, Craigslist in the States have just shut down, they've shut down all their personal ads. Backpage Adult is gone. Facebook has, uh, is very sensitive about certain topics. 
it's amazing the the uh, the effect that this has had in terms of shutting down the conversation around sexuality. Now, I don't deny that child pornography and sex sex sexual exploitation is a problem for sure, but. While this act vaguely justifies itself on that imperative of protecting vulnerable populations, the real effects uh, end up generating restrictions on the activity of and the content that could otherwise improve the thriving online experience and sexual expression of internet users. Like it's, which is, you know, which is where we're all turning to these days. Everything's going online. Like, where do we find out about? information it's it's there where do we build our communities it, it, a lot of it is online so to me this is a very big baby to throw out with the bathwater <laughs> and it you know it just doesn't make sense to me because this is a very short-sighted strategy like it's 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 what got us into this problem in the first place don't talk about it but how do we fix a problem that we can't talk about it just makes me crazy <laughs> It just pushes the, it just pushes the problem underground, you know, and then people end up getting hurt. It's just, it's just it 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 doesn't make sense to me. So I say like stop censoring this shit and start educating people, right? Like how about instead we raise our awareness around child pornography and sex trafficking, you know, so that we can more readily identify who these people are and take action on these problems rather than just shutting the whole conversation down. Now. I don't consider myself a conspiracist or anything like that, typically. But I'm going to give myself permission right now, just to let that run just for a second here. Does anybody know what big data is? Put up your hand. Big data is a, is a reference to, you probably even have a better definition. This is my partner, Jenna, by the way. I'll tell you to talk about her. It's like there's a lot of information out there about all of us. Mm -hmm. All right? They're tracking our conversations, our whereabouts, our personal data. Uh, I, I use my fingerprint to open my camera. They can do retinal scans. And, you know, it gets me thinking that wouldn't being able to pick out these people who are, are really the people who are, um, who are the child pornographers and, 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 and uh, exploiting people sexually, don't you think it would be a little easier to kind of pick these people out of the crowd? It's hard to stay uh, um, anonymous these days in this world. So is it really about sex trafficking? It makes me wonder if this kind of censorship is less about protecting vulnerable populations and more about social control. And my best guess as to why they want to throw out the entire baby with the bathwater is because sexuality is at the heart of our innate inner power. But sex is seen as a threat, especially to those people who want to manage us. And our culture works to control the expression of our sexuality from birth onwards. It suppresses our ability to access our full source of personal empowerment. So it's easier to control uneducated and disempowered people. And another thing that happened to me just the other day, which really kind of freaked me out, is I, uh, I was doing this talk, and I, I'm using Google Voice Search, and I say, I, I can't remember what it was, but I was referencing blowjob. <clears throat> and when I said blowjob, on the screen came B asterisk, 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 asterisk. I went, what the fuck? That's exactly what I said. <laughs> Masturbation is still not a word in Word doc. If I try to type it into my notes or my Facebook, anything masturbation, like you said, separate it or change it into a word. Yeah. Fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> try, 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 try slut. Try cunt, you get the same thing. The well, word breast is not in my home's dictionary. If I type in breast, it tries to change it to breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is great and all this. Like, you can't talk about breasts unless they're I know. You know, in a non-sexual oh, oh, oh. context. Makes me crazy. Breast yeah. Cancer. So I'm appreciative. Yo, so good. So you can you see what I'm talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? And then another thing that happened to me not too long ago is uh, I finally got into Pinterest because uh, I'm also... I'm also a budding photographist, uh, photographer, or I guess you could say I just really love taking pictures of naked women, uh, nude photography. And I've been doing tons of that with my partner here, and it's been lovely. So I was actually collecting, I had a Pinterest board of uh, nude models. There was nothing graphic about it. These were just beautiful, like artistic kind of things. I got a couple of warnings, and then one day, 
my board was just gone, just gone. And I'm like, come on. Anyway, so this, this, there's a long list of sexual suppression that's going on. And again, I'm clearly very passionate about it. I'm going to just try to calm down a little bit about it. Uh, but it's a really slippery slope, and I really think we're going in the wrong direction. And I think we need to open our eyes to that. So suppression is what, is what I would call the active avoidance of sexuality. But I think I'm even more concerned about repression of sexuality, which is the unconscious avoidance of sexuality. There's a saying that goes, the fish will be the last, water, the last to realize it's in water. So when we grow up surrounded by something, we're less likely to notice it. Okay, it's just what's normal. But normal isn't always healthy. Many of our irrational ideals, ideas about sexuality are so deeply entrenched in our culture that it's hard to see them as nonsensical. For example, this, the sight of new adult nudity is inherently harmful to children. <laughs> There's actually no empirical evidence to suggest this at all. In cultures where nudity is the norm, we don't have this issue. It's an artifact of a sexually disintegrated culture. And, and, and it was funny, because I, I was saying to my brother, I was on the, on the phone with him the other day, and uh, my partner and I were very, were very sexually open people, and, and we have this thing called the plounge. It's a big like, bed in, our, in, our, in our, our living room, and it's like room for like eight or ten people. And we often have sex on this bed. And in our apartment, uh, there's just windows everywhere, and we're on the second floor, so you can actually see up into our, our place. And I said, you know, uh, I don't know if, <laughs> what's that? How big is your apartment? How do you fit this huge thing in? <laughs> Come see, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> so I said to my brother, like I was, you know, researching laws, and I realized that if somebody looked into my apartment and saw me having sex, I, I can get in trouble for that. Yes. What the fuck? And then he said to me, yeah, but what about if, if, if what, what if there's children walking by and they see you? And I'm, I'm like, yeah, what if children see me? Like, see, so he's a lawyer. He's very educated, very bright guy. And he still has this idea that somehow it's inherently harmful. So anyways, makes me crazy. So I, 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 this is what I call the fishbowl of shame. It's like we're in it. We don't realize it, but it's going on around us. And so this is where the sexual suppression of the act of avoidance becomes the, the unconscious avoidance of sexuality. So it re, and it remains largely unnoticed until somebody starts talking around the family table about sex, or your, your child asks you what cunnilingus is, or you, know, you, 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 you take your top off, uh, women especially take your top off somewhere in the city, and you, you get in trouble for that. It's like, it's right there, and it's only until we kind of poke our finger into it that we, that we realize that it's happening. Again, there's a ton, I'm going to swear, I've already searched a ton shit more of information on this, but I had to cut it. So I started to look around at this, uh, this sexual mess that we're in. And so in the context that I work in, I'm a relationship therapist, this is what I saw in, in clients. Half of my clients that come in, come in because of infidelity. They're reeling from infidelity. And uh, I was cleaning mess up after mess after mess. And I'm like, and I started to scratch my head. And I started to wonder, like, you know, I started questioning the model of monogamy rather than, than the people who were cheating. I started questioning that. Now, as you might imagine, this is, was not particularly well received uh, by my clients who are coming in to talk to me, my partner cheated on me. And, uh, and I'm like, well, have you considered that, you know, that maybe monogamy is not a really suitable uh, model? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I started to read books like Sex at Dawn and things like that. And I realized that there's only like 3% of mammals that are reliably monogamous. And humans are not one of them. So this is just one example of how, we, how we've been given what I call a very, very small box for a very, very large drive. 
And of course, we're going to be constantly, here I am, cleaning up mess after mess after mess. And the truth is, I'm actually very tired of that. Uh, and I can't really do it yet much anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm working towards, with my clients, is uh, I understand they come from that model. And so the pain arises from that model. But at the same time, I'm trying my very best to gently start to inform and massage people and say, OK, you know, and what else, what else is going on here? It's not just, I said this yesterday in Mel's talk about you know, um, the monogamy hangover. It, you know, the, the reasons why people cheat, typically, or the, the story is, uh, there's got to be something wrong in your relationship, or you're ethically defunct. There's something wrong with you. There's, no converse, there's not a lot of conversation about, well, maybe we're trying to ask you to do the impossible. So I say we need a very we need a bigger box. So then I started to look at society, and I'm like, hey, what's going on in society? Well, there, there, I can I can summarize it in kind of two kinds of ways. There are the bad things that happen when we don't when we don't have a healthy relationship with sexuality or, or sexually integrated. We there are bad things that happen, and there are good things that don't. First, the bad things that happen. Back to the whack-a-mole analogy, is that when we kind of slam something down, it's going to pop up somewhere else. Here's, here's where it pops up. Sexual abuse, date rape, a $32 billion annual sex trafficking industry, serious porn addiction, closet masturbators, sexual harassment, objectification, and incest, just to name just a few. I'm not saying it's completely responsible. It's, that's not... There's other reasons why that's happening, but I would say that's a major reason. When we don't have a healthy way to express this very powerful drive, it's going to squirt out sideways in these other ways. There's a lot of trauma as a result of that. Pain, trauma, shame, insecurity, disconnection, and broken trust are all left in the wake of us not having a healthy relationship with our sexuality. And there's a ton more of that. But the good stuff that isn't happening is there is an immense amount of health benefits associated with, sex, with a healthy sex life. Here's the short list. Better blood pressure, less stress, better self-esteem, better sleep, improves heart health, boosts immune system, it's a great pain reliever, uh, it improves your mood, reduces prostate cancer, improves intimacy. Like it's, a, it's a long list of all the good things that happen with that. And it, uh, it reduces headaches. <laughs> So you can, you know, next time your partner says, oh, honey, got a headache, you know exactly what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and in my context as a relationship therapist, uh, over all the years and everything, I've kind of realized that uh, what, what people are suffering from is disconnection. Fundamentally, that is at the heart of uh, the pain that the couples I'm working with are dealing with. Sue Johnson, who is a, uh, a local therapist here, she is the founder of uh, Emotionally Focused Therapy. And uh, she summarized, she says, most of couples' issues in partnership can be rooted in disconnection. If you boil them down, it doesn't matter what they are, get them right down to the, the heart of it, it's disconnection. So the essence of my work has been about, and if you, if you go to my website, corequest.ca, it says, a journey back to connection. That's what it's about. We're trying to reconnect. Now, some of you may, may know Esther Perel. Uh, she had a recent book, uh, State of Affairs, it's awesome. Uh, her one before that, Mating in Captivity, she identifies that there are two primary languages of connection. The first one is uh, talk or communication, which we all know about, you know, open, honest, vulnerable, accountable uh, conversations that we have with each other. <clears throat> and the other is touch, affection, sex. Touch is actually our first language. Long before we learned language as a child, long before we learned it as a species, we used touch to connect, to communicate love. Right? And in no other activity is our skin so totally involved than during lovemaking, sex. So you might say that sex is the highest form of touch. And those of you who know something about attachment theory, there's been a lot of great research that, that says, look, uh, with infants and stuff like that, when, we, when they're not touched, they, there's, a, there's a cinema called uh, failure to thrive. And, and, and some infants will even die 
simply because of not touch. And, and, and when we're having sex and after, like just touch, the, the, the amount of powerful bonding chemicals that are coursing through our veins are numerous. First of all, oxytocin, otherwise known as the love hormone, that promotes generosity and trust and increases positive valuation. I'm sure some of you experience it afterwards. You just, you just see the beautifulness in the other, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Serotonin induces calmness and satisfaction. Dopamine is a mood elevator. And endorphins are all feel-good chemicals. There's all this good stuff happening when, we, when we're uh, really engaged with, with uh, healthy sexuality. And, and these are these associated sex hormones. They're associated with the well-functioning of our bodies, the prevention of disease, and, and our overall longevity in life. And sex is more than just our individual desires and our erotic experiences and our, and our intimate connections. It is what I consider to be the, the deepest expression of the power of creation. It's a fundamental force of vitality. So when we're not connected to that, that's a big part of what we're missing. It's part of what I was saying earlier. So then I started to look at me. What's going on with me and sex? I realized that not many people were talking about sex, but neither was I. I'm a relationship therapist. And, you know, if, if it's true that, that uh, you know, talking and touch are these, these two arteries of connection, and I'm not talking about sex, there's a problem. And I realized that in my own relationship that sexuality is absolutely, if I had to choose, and I'm a talker, right? I'm a therapist. I talk, and my partner happens to be a, 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 an aficionado around communication. And, uh, but sex, and, and when we're in deep, intimate communion, that's where I feel the most connected. So there was a huge gap between what was true for me and what I wasn't talking about with my clients. I was shocked. This is why I actually did this talk for a group of counselors a few months ago and said, hey, folks, we need to talk about this stuff because <laughs> it's really important, especially in terms, and not even just in terms of relationship therapists, any kind of therapy, therapist. That's what I'm saying. It's not integrated in, in, in our conversations, uh, and it needs to be. Okay. No! No! In fact, I, I, was, I was suggesting, I did the, the SAR course uh, not too long ago, and I'm like, you know what? It should be mandatory. Mandatory. It should be mandatory in any counselor training program. SAR is the Sexual Attitude uh, Restructuring. Restructuring. Yeah, people are calling it a couple of different. They called it restructuring. but, but No. I actually went and did it at uh, the Haven, which is awesome. No, it's called The Haven on, on Gabriola. Oh. And it was excellent. Like, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. Same course, yeah. Um, yeah, so it needs to be part of the curriculum, right? Um, and so I realized that I was really hiding a lot of, of my own sexual self. I'll, I'll tell you a story when I was uh, many years ago. It feels like many, maybe 12, 13 years ago. I remember I was in, in uh, Flight Center. Uh, I was uh, booking a, a holiday with my partner. And I walked in. You know how they have, have all the glossy uh, brochures of all the places you can go? I remember walking in, and, uh, and I caught out of the corner of my eye a brochure for hedonism. Does everybody know what hedonism is? Now, you have to understand that at this point, the idea of me going to something like that was like, you just watch that shit on television. You know, like you don't actually get to do that. So I remember walking in, and uh, I saw the hedonism guide. And so I, I walked by, and I stood in front of the couple's sandals brochure. But my eyes, <laughs> where I was checking out the hedonism, and I'm like, oh my god, is anybody looking? Like, I didn't want to be seen. Like, I was so contracted around even just picking up a flippin' brochure. It was ridiculous. I was like, that's how contracted I was around my sexuality. Yes? I'm from Jamaica, yeah. and I went. Yeah. Because it's literally like an hour and a 
house away from where I live. Yeah. Would you believe they have no calls? I was absolutely distraught my last trip, my, my last trip home to find out that they 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 closed. They had two. Yeah. Um there was one in the and one in Runaway Bay. And it was it was really quite lovely. Like people think, oh it's season, no. It's actually five stories are beautifully done, like yeah. cater to, you know, sexual liberated people and people who were just kind of sticking their toes in that water. Like, yeah. so you had people who were completely on one side and people who were sort of the nudes world. and the prudes. Yes. Yeah. And they were closed and I thought, Oh my god, this is so terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I got there before it closed. Because <laughs> I. So okay. Where? Oh. Um, okay. I, I, um, two of my friends are presenting at a group on event at Hedonism right now. I think it's Hedonism 3, um, still in Jamaica. Um, there's a chance maybe it's in a different uh, yeah, resort. But I know there was Hedonism. Yeah, Hedonism 3 closed a yes. few years ago. Um, this event that. My friends are at you must be hedonism too. So okay. um, as you're saying that, I was just quickly googling, check in with me after, and I'll tell you whether it's still Thank you. open because otherwise they're either way they're presenting at some sort of group on the conference at a tropical resort in Jamaica, and so yeah, this is sex positive enough, enough to still be posting these events. Great. Negrel. Negrel. So that flight center story really, I realized, you know, I need to do something about this. I need to begin this journey of becoming more sexually integrated. So um, at the time, uh, I had spent, at, I think, nearly 15 years with a group called ClearMind International. Does anybody know who ClearMind is? No. ClearMind is a personal growth school. They have counselor training programs. They run workshops called Awakenings and a whole bunch of things. I have to give them a ton of kudos. They were amazing. A, a lot of my growth happened there. But uh, the door here was shut. They did not talk about sex at all. And I, t I did all their programs, and then I taught for them for a number of years in their counselor training programs, but they couldn't talk about the down here. So I was like, okay, I got to get out of here. And I got involved with a group called Warrior Sage, uh, which uh, Sachin Raja, uh, you know, he was a big David Data, I think he's a David Data student, and, and, and so it was all about you know, conscious sexuality, and, and uh, so I got really involved with them. I took pretty much all their programs. Um, I started, it, I was reading books like Ethical Slut, Sex at Dawn, uh, Finding God Through Sex, which is one of David Data's books uh, about sexual enlightenment. You should see my bookshelf now. <laughs> when I, I actually moved about uh, four years ago from a big house, and, and you know, I was a student, so I had <laughs> lots of books. I got them all down to basically two shelves, and the two shelves you'll see at my home right now, every one of them, except for one which is about, I think, kayaking or hiking or something, is about sex. And, uh, and then as life went on, there was, this, uh, there was a sexual drought after my, uh, my child was born with my partner at the time. And, uh, you know, I was totally understandable about that. And after about five years of that, I was like, I couldn't, couldn't stand anymore. I started to make a bit more of a fuss. Uh, and then one day, um, uh, my partner and I agreed we we're going to go to the Taboo Sex Show. <clears throat> and uh, and I, had a, I think I had a men's group that night, and she said she would go early, and then I would meet her there. <clears throat> so I met her there later in the evening, and she took me to uh, one of the booths. Uh, it was called Eden, uh, which is a swingers club. It's a sex club. Uh, and uh, I, my eyes, when she brought me over there, I'm like, 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 do you know what this is? Like, what are you? And she's like, yeah, yeah. I just thought maybe it would be fun to maybe go there and kind of hang out in the energy. And I'm like, you can imagine what I was thinking. I'm like, oh. <laughs> like the energy in me just just surged. And so we started swinging, which was. Epic! It was amazing. I'm like, oh my god, because I had been with her at this point uh, for ten years, and and you know, uh, the the last five years of those ten was uh, I would call it a sexless marriage, which is ten times or less a year. So here we are out swinging, and uh, and it was totally my thing, but it totally wasn't her thing. 
And, uh, but I realized, this was a really big turning point, I realized that I couldn't go back. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't go back. It wasn't, it wasn't, I couldn't live that lie in my body. I knew I wasn't going to survive in that. So I was at this major crossroads now. And there were some serious consequences. I realized that if I pushed for an open sexual relationship with my partner, that I was risking the marriage, I was risking the family, and I realized if I pushed, if I pushed, uh, if I challenged the model of monogamy with my clients, that I risked my reputation as a as the relationship expert. Like I had a good, I had a very thriving practice. I had like eight counselors working for me. I was like killing it, and I was like did workshops called the Relationship Revolution. I was all about making, relation, making monogamy work. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so there were some serious consequences ahead of me. There is a cost to becoming sexually integrated. There's uh, the fear of judgment, of being ostracized, of professional consequences, loss of relationships, breaking down of families. It's, there's some serious hurdles to cross here. And coming out or being transparent about this stuff exposes us to toxic shame. I love the talk on shame the other day, the, panel, the panelists the other day, they really nailed some really important things. Um, and what I liked about what they said is that we are fundamentally social beings, we're wired for connection, right? We need tribe to survive. And so shame hits us at this most vulnerable, this Achilles heel. It says shame is uh, the feeling that warns us that we're in danger of becoming disconnected. It hits us in the center. The consequence of not aligning with cultural norms risks us getting kicked out of the tribe. And so this is exactly what I was up against. So again, a major, major turning point for me. The stakes are very high. I had to, do I shut up and play by society's rules and, and stay in the club? Or do I stand for what feels true and risk the consequences of being ostracized and everything? <clears throat> so uh, I made the decision to stand for what felt true for me. Um, and the marriage ended. And I, I didn't leave the marriage. <laughs> I just stood for what my truth was. And, and then the, the marriage disintegrated. Now the marriage, there was a lot of other things that weren't going well there. But sex and me wanting to be a fucking swinger was what got pinned on this. So, and it took me about two years for this whole process to, to occur where the relationship ended. And uh, lost a lot of friends. I was accused of having a midlife crisis. I was judged harshly by a number of my friends. I don't know. Is that, can anybody relate to that? Like what that, yeah. Well, it's just the midlife crisis thing. Because midlife crisis happens when there's a reawakening of like all this stuff that I've been repressed with for so long. Yes. And I'm finally like, there's truth to another part of me. Yeah. So that always gets tinged with like, Rush. Right. It's actually I totally agree. I love midlife crisis. Like, yeah. okay, folks, shake it up. See what's really true for you. Yeah. I'm a totally big fan for that, but mostly people see it as the bad thing. And that's yeah, what. Because it's not part of the norm of our culture that says stay in the marriage of the wife. Yeah, like I was totally up again. I was caught in this, the, the monogamy hangover. I was like, I was, you know, that was my job. And so here I was, the whole thing was getting turned upside down. Um, one of the biggest consequences of all that was I lost my relationship with my son. Uh, at the end of at the dissolving of the marriage, uh, I th I'll just call it parental alienation, uh, lost my relationship, and I hadn't had contact with him for uh, seven years. So he was 11, 10 or 11 when we separated, uh, and I haven't seen him for seven years. That's probably my deepest regret, um, the deepest consequence I've had to face. So now that I was out of my marriage, <laughs> I gave myself full permission, no holds bar, 
to just give her sexually and just do everything that I wanted to do and be. It was the first time I had seen a sex worker for the first time. I did a, whole, did a lot of uh, going to sex clubs, uh, the ones that I could as a single male, which aren't many. Um, I participated in my first bukkake scene, my one and only, actually. Uh, I became a full-on burner. I don't know if I'm you know, burning man, but I was just like, woo, just having a good time. I went to Thailand to study Tantra. Uh, I had my first threesome. I took a bunch of body electric courses, which were really amazing, uh, and I attended a ton of just Tantra uh, play parties and things like that. And I eventually got to the point where I made this commitment to myself that I would be fully out about my sexuality to everyone, my friends, my partner, my clients, everybody, no exceptions at all. And it... it, it it was a, I called it radical transparency because I thought, well, if I'm going to hide this stuff about myself, I'm implying that somehow I'm shameful about it. There's something wrong with it. And I was not prepared to do that. Nothing I was doing was uh, wrong or bad. And uh, although most, a lot of other people would say that, I didn't think so. So I just didn't, al I didn't, didn't allow myself to be anything less than full truth. I actually have a tattoo on my back. It's a, a, a sun, and underneath it says, truth above all. I, I got it probably about 20 years ago, and it's still absolutely true for me today. That, that is my primary directive, is the truth. So losing relationships and all this stuff was, uh, a lot of it was deeply painful for me, but I realized that that was the cost of living my truth. And the truth is, I was like, I needed to live authentically. So these, these lost relationships... At some level, that's okay in a way, too, because I actually wanted to be surrounded by people, friends, clients, people, who supported the truth of who I am. I don't expect everybody to align with the truth of who I am, but the people I want to hang out with are those people. So despite those hardships, the rewards have been truly inspiring for me. I have to say that I, I am the happiest I've ever been in my life. I'm on fire. I'm at the prime of my life. Uh, I, because, because I actually believe that I've tapped into the heart and the source of my, my deepest power, sexuality. Uh, since then, I've, I've found uh, what I call my sexual equal, my beloved Jenna here. Um, I would call her the one. I love, Dan Savage says, there is no the one. There's the 6.4. You round that motherfucker up, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, would, I, have to say, I have to say she's about a 9.8. <laughs> We're three years in, uh, so I recognize that we might still be in the NRE, the new relationship energy piece. Uh, but it's been pr very incredible. I'm having the very best sex of my life. I'm turning 50 in two months, and I'm like, woohoo! Uh, a lot of my sexual fantasies have become realities. Uh, we just had our first threesome on Thursday night. It was super awesome. Um, and together we're launching. There are some postcards on your table for Fierce Loving. This is, a, this is a, a, our heart project that uh, we want to teach couples because uh, uh, we got some good skills in communication and sexuality. And so that's what, that's what we want to teach. So really living uh, my deepest purpose in partnership with my partner. I get to give public talks like this to groups of people. It's awesome. The work that I'm doing now is much more aligned with, uh, I, just love, I just love my work. We call it play now because it's not work. Uh, and I have a, a lovely large tribe of sex positive friends that I get to hang out with quite regularly and have a lot of fun with. And the good news is that uh, after seven years of not having a relationship with my son, about three months ago, I had my first session with him and I and a therapist. Uh, we've had two sessions so far, so there's, a, there's, a, there's the beginnings of a reclaiming of my relationship with my son. So what that tells me, and it's been a long journey, is that I can be sexually integrated and, and still have the people who are important to me in relationships. Long journey, though. So... Continuing on this road of becoming sexu sexually integrated is certainly not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process. It's an, it's an evolution. It's an evolution. 
And uh, just even recently, uh, <clears throat> maybe four or five months ago, um, we have a, an agreement in our relationship uh, that we can talk about anything. There's nothing that we can't talk about. And of course, sex comes up a lot. And so she says to me one day, Trevor, I'd really like you to make a list of all the things. If you were completely, fully sexually integrated, sexually expressed, what would that look like? And she said, I don't want you to consider me at all in that. I just want you to say your truth. And I was like, again, this is a story about repression. I didn't realize how much more there was. I was like, okay. So I gave, I, there was a list, of, I think it was 12 or 16 items or something like that. And uh, it was an amazing evolution because, and then I presented it to her, which was very fucking scary. And I said all these things, one of which was a, have a threesome and like different things like that. And uh, the, 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 the evolution that's occurred as a result of that has been amazing. And then so I invited her to make the same list, show it to me. And so it created this beautiful conversation of expansion and integration in our relationship. And, you know, for me, uh, I said I'm a budding sex activist. Uh, that's, that's true for me. Uh, the more people I can get talking to and waking people up around this stuff, it's really important to me. So I like to, th I'm, 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 I'm imagining, I'm, I want to take courses on, you know, activism. What to do? Like, I actually don't really know much about that at all. I've got a good friend, Kai, who was an activist for a number of years, so probably going to pick his brain. Um, yeah, and I want to take some more political stands. I want to have sex on my plowed without getting in trouble. It's crazy. And I would say that becoming more sexually integrated is more than just an individual endeavor. It's a collective endeavor. This is not just about us. We need to all work together for a more sexually integrated society. So that we can, so that we can, you know, mitigate the tragic consequences of being a sexually disintegrated society. Like all this, we can avoid this stuff. We can avoid a lot of this stuff. I, I know I'm. This is idealistic, but uh, we have to shoot for some ideals. Right? Yeah. I, I, I'm thinking I'm very like, overwhelmed by your conversation because I feel that in my experience, I, I'm there. Like I, I'm sexually integrated with my parents. Like because of my conversations with them, like they both own sex toys for themselves. Sweet. I told them we're great. Yeah. And like that, I don't, didn't know so much because I don't necessarily tell everybody that part of our relationship that I have with my parents. But I do, they're like, that's fucking crazy. Like you don't even know that that's not normal. Yeah, yeah. Like, but it is normal, like it can't be normal. I know, yeah. yay. So like, it's just very cool to sort of, or it's, it's interesting and, and, and opening to me to see the, the other side and seeing all the shame, but actually that I came from the total opposite. Like, where I found me master, and that's great. We do that in our bedroom. Oh. That was the conversation. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, you're private time, bye. And then, you know, so I've never had that shame growing up. And then, and then because of that, I've been able to, like, expand so much more. And I'm, like, wanting to give them that. Great. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it does happen, and we can keep it going. That's the world I want us all to grow up yeah. in, right? For sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I think that if we don't, if we don't collectively get together, uh, again, this alarmist part of me uh, thinks that we're on a bit of a slippery slope here, and we're going in the wrong direction with every these these things that are shutting down and closing down, and uh, it, it's deeply concerning. And I'm deeply committed to uh, reducing harm in the world, and I'm deeply committed to increasing the well-being and joy of people in the world. And sex is a big part of that. So those are some of my next steps. I'm just, I'm, I'm keeping going here. I'm not, I don't know what's next, but I'm just like, just keep following the breadcrumbs and see what's next here. And uh, so like, I want to, I want to ask the question to all of you about what your next steps are. Shame to me is, is really at the heart, heart of the issue. And uh, shame really does love to hide out, right? We don't like to talk about, and for good reason. If we get kicked out of the tribe, it just really, again, really hits us at the heart here. And uh, this actually was something I, I learned from Kai in some discussions, that the remedy to a lot of this is uh, uh, exposure or gentle exposure, oh, and gentle exposure with groups so that we can <clears throat> get a sense of universality that we're not in this alone, that you know, just because 
for example, you like to be choked or you have a rape fantasy, that that's not that weird. But we don't know that unless we start getting out there and talk, talking to people. So exposure is, is a big part of it. So I encourage you all to find whatever your edge is. And I know a lot of you, your edges are a lot further along than the average folk. But whatever, the, we all have our edge, whatever that is, lean just beyond it. The opportunities to become more sexually integrated are many. We gotta talk about sex. We gotta talk to our friends, our partners, our colleagues. There's a whole movement of sex positive education going on that we like this, and we need to keep, keep that going. Uh, attending conferences like this one, uh, ConvergeCon is amazing. Uh, maybe you want to make your own sex list. If you're in partnership or you have partners, I don't care how many or how few, just share with them. Get them in there. Um, come out to a trusted friend about some aspect of your sexuality. Um, attend the SAR course. We talked about that earlier. Uh, um, there's the Sacred Sexual Music Festival happening on April 22nd. Come to that. Jen and I are going to be there presenting a, a, a little workshop on elemental touch. It's tantric touch. Um, come to our fierce loving programs. Uh, we're going to teach you all about, uh, we, we have thing, things called Sunday flings where you come out for a half a day and we teach you some really good information and get experiential and you walk away with something, uh, how to deepen and mas master your intimacy. Uh, work on body acceptance. Uh, read those awesome books that are out there. There's some really great books out there. Uh, the Art of Loving is a great place to do. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, share a fantasy with your partner. Uh, check out Fet Life before it's gone. Um, uh, attend the Tantra Festival. There's one happening in June. Uh, work with a talented sex worker. Uh, go to a cuddle party. So, yeah, so I think that's five, five minutes. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave, uh, I'll leave you with this. this I, ha I have a dream. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day we're able to talk about sex with as much ease as we talk about the weather. I have a dream that, that, that the tragedies and the sexual trauma uh, as a result of sex going sideways and bad things happening is eliminated. <clears throat> I have a dream that, that for example... You know, you know how the East Ballroom has been, has been, uh, was created because last year some hotel guests got comfortable about some conversations had about sex. Well, my dream is that we don't have to have that room there. We can have those conversations wherever. That we have a society that turns to education rather than censorship to resolve issues related to sex. That we have a much bigger box around sexuality where we can really reclaim and celebrate the innate sexual beauty and power that we have as beautiful human beings, that we resurrect sex back to its rightful place in, in our society. I have a dream that that 12-year-old boy, instead of being nervous about pulling that book off the shelf and scurrying up to his stair upstairs and being just so contracted by being found out, that instead it's like, oh, hey, this is interesting, da, 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 and then walks on over to dad and mom and says, hey, this is really cool, tell me more about this. That's the world that I want to grow up in. Okay? So that's it. I, I hope, like, I really wanted to share this kind of personal evolution with you. I, 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 I know all of you are on this journey in some place, and I can encourage you to keep that journey going. Um, and I hope that I've inspired you, and I'm really grateful that you showed up on the Sunday morning. So.